One of my ongoing projects uh, is on memorial architecture and Jewish dimension on it, so that's why I, I suppose I was invited, and that's why I would like to share with you some of the thoughts. And um, <clears throat> so I propose, uh, I understood that you all had questionnaires, and because it's a com combination of lecture and workshop, I propose to do it in vivid, vivid way, so that you're not <clears throat> going to be bored uh, until I'll talk one hour and then uh, we will discuss. <clears throat> I think that uh, let's go through topics and then uh, I will ask a question and <clears throat> let's do it this way. If somebody would like, uh, uh, would have an answer, so please raise your hand and we'll answer. Otherwise, I will pick up anyone. Mm -hmm. So let's say one, one answer <coughs> per topic, per question, and then I think it will go vividly. And uh, so if you agree with that, let's, let's start. And <coughs> I was privileged, I, in, my, in my work in history and, and personal history, I was privileged to know quite many great people. And one of them was Elie Wiesel, whom I knew when my husband we knew uh, Elie for 25 years, 25 last years of, of his life. And um, probably because of that, I have this first <coughs> question uh, written there, uh, which <clears throat> Eli, who was a prolific teacher and loved to do it, and his way of doing it was also to put very many questions, like, and 90% of those questions he put to himself, basically. Uh, so, <clears throat> in one of his lectures and one of his writings, he put this question, who is of the greater importance, the architect or the dreamer? And I hope that uh, through our conversation and workshop, we will come to conclusion. Let's see. So would your answer will be the same as Ellie's, or it would be something different? <coughs> and uh, so um, my topics for, for this would be, as you can see, so what is the meaning of this question? Why on earth he start to think this way? Uh, why one has to choose between the two? One, one, one has to choose between architect and a dreamer, a poet, I would say. So I understood that 80% of you here are architect students. So have you ever been thinking like a poet or like a dreamer? And if you did, so what prompted you? And um, was it any result? Was it any project that you would like to, to do? Was it any impression? that you was just thinking about. And the que uh, other question is, can it, can it be combined, the two, in your profession, in profession of architect? I noticed that we have history students here as well. <laughs> so for history students to be a dreamer, it's a very dangerous thing. Mm -hmm. let's, <laughs> let's put it aside. But for architectural students and for, for people who are also practicing a public dimension of, of architecture and culture, so can it be combined? to be an architect and a dreamer. And uh, so to start with, <coughs> is somebody recognizing the building? This is Boston. Uh, yes, but you are a professor. <laughs> <laughs> yes, so the, the building is a part of the great <coughs> New England uh, Holocaust Memorial in, in Boston. So before we go any further, uh, can anyone from students tell me, do you know about this project and uh, about this monument and what do you think about it? Is anyone familiar with this? Right, <laughs> so the project is <coughs> uh, done by very famous architect Stanley Steinovich, Saitovich in, in the United States. And as you might know, uh, or I will tell you, it was uh, a very big deal for New England and for Boston Stephanie here from the States, so she knows about it. So people were awaiting this memorial very many years. And when it was uh, erected, uh, I think, you will, you will correct me if I'm wrong, but it was unanimous, unanimous support for that. It was complete success. And why is that? Because in this project, <coughs> uh, architect and the engineers and designers, they succeed uh, completely to make it modern, 
to make it particular, to make it very respectful to human memory, and also in personal terms, because in those cubes, in those big six columns, uh, there are names. There are names. So names are engraved in crystal. And so you can take your children and you can go slowly or you can actually rush to your work because a uh, city administration building is, stays just, just opposite here. Uh, and anyway, every day or very so often when you are there, you are passing a living memory in very delicate way, in very modern way, in very light and enlightening way. And in my questionnaire to you, dear students, there are four here <coughs> mentioned. As you can see it here, what is the memorial um, architectural particularities in this project? So uh, you will be here for, I'm leaving tomorrow, but you will be here for four days. And our ideas <coughs> for this seminar was that you will work through the questionnaire and to write your answers in the end. And we will collect your replies, and I will analyze it. And so uh, then it would be uh, coming an article, a uh, scientific article uh, of me, my analysis of your thinking. So please take care on this. And <clears throat> whatever you don't know, have a look for, for, for those memorials and those projects that I'm mentioning here. So the questions are, what are the memorial's main characteristics in these memorials? What are memorial architectural particularities? And what they are other particularities than architectural, if you will find any there? I did, but I'm interested to hear about it from you. And what is the most, the strongest impression personal uh, that this memorial would evoke in you? So I propose you to have a look <coughs> on the memorial picture <coughs> uh, on the net, uh, because there are six columns like that, and th they are set in the huge square of Boston in particular way. There's also stones downstairs, there's also water. So you will see many elements in this, and I'm kindly ask you to, to do your homework uh, in, in a way to reply on my questions and mostly on the last one. So what are your personal impressions on, on this? Okay, let's switch. <coughs> and my uh, talk to you today, it's a little bit jumpy because I wanted to to mention very many different subjects to to be a east for, for the seminar to evoke your thinking about, about it. So in memorial architecture, um, one particular segment is Jewish, Jewish segment in memorial architecture. And for this, uh, I think one of the most particular um, projects uh, is uh, Felix Nussbaum Museum in Osnabrück in Germany which was done by Daniel Lipskind uh, in 1994. Now, who, who knows who, who was uh, Felix Nussbaum from the students? Catastrophe we have. Uh, Felix Nussbaum, again, please look in, uh, in Google. <coughs> Felix Nussbaum was a fantastic artist uh, from Germany, uh, hiding in Belgium. Uh, dramatically, uh, actually, he was um, he was announced to the police, and it was not uh, after after three years in hiding, uh, <coughs> in really very very enormous uh, enormous difficult conditions, and um, he was denounced, but not even by any evil plot, uh, which is particular in case of Felix Newsbaum, he was denounced like offhand, like matter of talk. Oh, by the way, this Jewish hiding over there. It was just like that in his very case. So <clears throat> Nussbaum was 34 when he was deported to Auschwitz. All his family was deported also, a little bit before and a little bit after. All were aghast. And um, he produced uh, the art in which depiction of fear is the most profound with regard to the Holocaust, uh, talking about visual arts. Uh, uh, it's very important that Nussbaum didn't do it 
uh, didn't do this metaphorical expressionist uh, art uh, in dramatic way before the war. He was a good artist. He did landscapes and on, um, on many other things. <coughs> but when war started and he was fugitive and for so many people, uh, we could come to the same stories, not today, but in general, in the narrative of the Holocaust. Uh, people who are like Walter Benjamin, fantastic German uh, philosopher and prolific uh, artist, uh, writer, who uh, was teaching in Milano in university, and who, like Nussbaum, they were fugitives without uh, documentation, without right to live, without anything, without property, without house, without address, without anything, uh, without health. So people were completely deprived of everything, uh, yet before they were uh, exterminated. And um, of all the artists uh, who were drawing, and because you can only draw, and he did also oil, uh, and making uh, <coughs> visual art on Holocaust, Nussbaum's art is the most adequate to the total fear. So I strongly, strongly recommend you uh, to have a look onto his art, um, and then you will see. It, it's like we were talking with Stephanie today that uh, for school children in any school of any city, of any place on earth, you just have to uh, read the night of Elie Wiesel. And it is one book that you can read, and then you know the essence of Holocaust. You don't know all details, but you know the essence of it. <coughs> Very same for Nussbaum in visual art. You have seen his picture, you know what Holocaust was about, and you know how it was depicted in art. Daniel Lipskind, whose family, <coughs> as you might know, I hope you do, <coughs> uh, uh, also the family of Holocaust survivors had to do with Holocaust, uh, is very particularly attached to, to the theme. And in this project, in his museum, uh, he, uh, I think he put it probably best of his architectural potencies and effort because it's very honest. It's completely tragic, as you can see, but it's also very honest. And it's, it speaks to, I think, everyone. And um, so this, the emphasize also the very, the most important element in Jewish segment in memorial architecture, which is a drama or tragedy and um, sort of feeling of, fatal fear. And this is uh, <coughs> the same museum, so you can see it from, from above, from aerial, aerial planning. So for architectural students, just to, to have a look and understand how he built the, uh, the premises. And uh, this museum was the one of the first serious projects uh, for Lipskind. Uh, another <coughs> recent, very recent uh, work in a Jew Jewish segment in memorial architecture is a UK National Holocaust Memorial Project. Uh, this project is shortlisted one by um, Professor Rainer Mahlamiaki, uh, my friend uh, with who, and colleague with whom I'm working on my project on memorial architecture. So <clears throat> there were, I think, 80 contenders and all of world leading architects. And short list was 10, and all of them was stars. And this is one of the one of, of project which was shortlisted. Um, the Israeli um, UK uh, British project won. And um, and actually, I found that they are quite similar things. But you can see how in 25 years, from 1994 to 2017, the stylistics of Jewish segment in memorial architecture changes from the very edgy message that Lipskind set in Germany to I th open and blatant elegant, modern, but not too modern um, 
statement by Mahlamiaki and, and his company. And in this case, in London case, it's very tricky project because Osnabrück, it's a, it's a German city in which um, uh, Nussbaum family lived and they have nothing more than that museum from the serious historical point of view. London, it's another story. And this museum would stay in the very center, very, very heart of London, just opposite the parliament, the British parliament. It's a huge campaign, public campaign, still today. So uh, it was <clears throat> uh, shortlisted and a winner was pronounced last summer. Uh, but still today, there is a very big public debate on would be this, this um, memorial built or not because some people are thinking that it's too sensitive to, or maybe too declarative, in quote marks, to put it in the heart of London, just opposite uh, the British Parliament. So uh, there are quite, uh, my colleagues architecture know more about it, but as far as I know, there's, there's still open question about will this project will ever be realized? But my point here is, is that um, memorial architecture has a very uh, specific Jewish segment in this. And we have, if we are working in this, we have to remember about it. This is Mahlamek is part of the project for the same London project, uh, which we don't know if it ever will be built. Now, <clears throat> you were, if you have questions, please. Ask me through, through the way. <clears throat> uh, now we are <clears throat> going to spiritual segment of, of memorial architecture, to spiritual heritage and historical synagogues. Uh, I try to not to, to talk about synagogues too much because very many people will speak about synagogues uh, in, in to, m tomorrow and, and other days. So, but little bit I will say <clears throat> most important thing here is um, a view of his, pr namely historical synagogues, and some of you were special, specialists as I understood on this or, or were, were studying this. Uh, so what to do is it? It's, it's two approaches because of existing conditions and situation, either to preserve it and to make it uh, a museum subject, like it was done in Palin. And we have two colleagues from Pauline here, so they can tell more about it. It's a grandiose project. The Gvozdjet Synagogue made in Pauline, I think it's one of the probably most unique and, and fantastic projects because uh, the team of, of uh, how many you had? 90. Yes. I think it was about, about between 19, uh, 80 and 90, something, something like that. So meticulously restored, absolutely precious synagogue because when people are coming, when you're visiting Pauline and you see people coming there and seeing this very atypical for big part of the world synagogue and this, all this intricate artwork, all restored, all honored and preserved as a museum exponent exhibit. So you can see that, yes, we preserve it. We, we had it. We have it. <clears throat> at, at the same time, there is another way of, of doing it. Uh, and this is Yoniskis here in Lithuania. So you have two big buildings, fantastic buildings, uh, fantastic now, but how de dilapidated they were several years ago. So you have these buildings which are restored preserved and, and are <clears throat> also used for cultural functions. And actually it's up to you, up to, uh, up to public to, to, to make your mind how, what to do because there are very many people who are saying, as in the case with Great Synagogue in Vilna, so why we will restore the whole thing? No, who will go there to pray? But this is not about this. It's certainly not about who will go to pray. After the Holocaust, this question is invalidated. You can't, you can't talk about it this way, it's, it's just wrong. But when you preserve synagogue like Yoniki, Yoniskis, and you make a culture venue of it, I think, my personal opinion, that memory lives. 
that it's preserved. It's far better that it would be dilapidated and, and just stay li like nobody's interested about it, nobody knows about it. So I think that it would be very important for you as a young generation architect to, to think about it, to read about it, and to make your mind what you would do if you would be a city architect and you would have, of course there are very many conditions, what to do here and what to do with Gwazdic. There are certain conditions, objective conditions, but still, you as a city architect, you do have a, some kind of, of leverage and, and some kind of possibility to decide what you will do, how active you will make memory. Speaking in matter of historical synagogues of Europe, which Europe is <laughs> just devoid of Jews. Not entirely, but as you know, quite, quite substantially. So this is one of, of, the, of the things that I, I think it's very, very important. And, and in my questionnaire I'm writing about, my question is which criteria and which means you will use to connect yourself, yourself, your generation, uh, with the historical knowledge and personal experience of the past. It's very, very important what to do. Of course, in some extreme cases, people can make, I don't know, something, not of course nightclub, but something, some kind of like cinema or something, something wrong. And this is, you have to avoid, you have to, to think about what's about boundaries of past and how to respect it. Also, nobody is there from Jewish population. And, and this is, and who, who is interested in this? And I know that on the way to Yoniskis, there is one more synagogue right now, which is uh, about to be restored. And I think it's right, because there is such thing as historical fairness. And even, even I think it's very serious argument, but it's up to you because you are architects, you are planners, you are thinkers. So what you will do. So that's that's important. Now coming closer to you, <coughs> uh, historical aspect on uh, memorial architecture. Uh, you know, with um, generations coming in natural course of this stage. For instance, if somebody will ask me what I think and how I relate to the Great War, I can only think about something very well-known episodes. I do not have feeling of how it was during the Great War. However, my family and I do have a very distinctive feeling how it was during the Holocaust. But you, your generation, you do not. And if you're going to cinema and you watch Schindler List, I definitely not the best case, the best, not the best way, it's good, but it's not the best way to, to learn about it. So what to do? How to connect? This case, which is in front of you, it's New Tallinn Synagogue. Uh, it is in, in Estonia. <clears throat> I know them very well, and I know the project very well. Uh, do you know them, this architect? Yeah. <clears throat> uh, it's a young uh, bureau, very, very able, uh, named Coca Architects, and there's not a single Jewish person there. And the architect, Andrus Koresar. So what they did, the leadership of, of the Estonian Jewish community was smart enough to choose, as, as our Lithuanian hosts were smart enough to invite, invite all of you to, today and, and for the seminar, smart enough to invite a young Gentile architect to send them to Israel for two weeks. Uh, of course, it was not enough. I, I, as far as I remember, probably they came some, some other times. And they came out with their own vision, their own project. Nobody interfered. And this is beautiful. And it works. And it um, encompasses, again, I, I, I can see that you are not <clears throat> very familiar with this project. So whatever I am showing you, I, I suggest you to have a look on, on net, on, on the... <coughs> on the images for that. 
Uh, it's now the new Tallinn Synagogue, which is 11 years old only. It's regarded as one of the most beautiful modern synagogues uh, in Europe. Uh, it has <coughs> stream of visitors. It's very accommodating. It's very light, uh, enlightening. Again, um, modern and beautiful. And it's very, it goes completely with Jewish tradition. And there's nothing wrong with that. And it's absolutely amazing that the non-Jewish architects just did it. This is probably one of the very rare cases, but it's absolutely possible. And I think it's, it's very, very important. And um, again, one of my questions to you here is how would you project the architectural tools and design resolutions for reflecting the feeling of hope in the darkest historian narrative? So it's all about you, but before you start to think and to do, you have to learn, as far as I understand, a lot. It's, it's not only about form. It's not only about blueprints. It's, first of all, I think it's about history, and it's about human dimension in this, <coughs> and memory. Because good ar memorial architecture is a uh, a convey, it's conveying of memory, it's conveying of, of feelings that engaging other people to get into your building. It's not only your own statement. You have to engage others to, to be interested at least, to come close, if not inside. So my next uh, sample <coughs> is again, generational prism, and this is a special project. Do you know about it? So this is this is project from last year, <coughs> from the uh, invi invited close competition in Saint Petersburg. Uh, they decided to build a new museum for the siege for Saint Petersburg siege, and it was uh, invitation <coughs> uh, for forty architects. Ten of them were foreign architects, and in short list there were four. One of them was foreign. And this is his project. <coughs> it's again Mahlamiaki's project. It's called Requiem. And it's, it, it, what is very, very interesting is that it's one public vo vote. So they put a public vote in a very special exhibit in St. Petersburg for three months. And they did it twice. And very atypical and very unexpected, totally unexpected public vo vote twice for Finnish project. Uh, it still be open, <coughs> uh, would it be built like that or it would be something else because you never know what's going on in Russia. My point here is the following. Rainer Mahlamiaki himself, he knows very well <coughs> um, history because he, as, as you might know, he is the author of Pauline Museum and, and he is of my generation so we know Holocaust pretty well, we feel it. What he did, he works with his students. 80 or 90 percent of people who are working in his bureaus are his students because he is dean of architectural uh, faculty of all university. So he teaches for 23 <coughs> years, and he takes his best students to work for him. Uh, and this is, as you can see, definitely is a project made by the young and modern brain. And this is beautiful and functional. And it appeals to new generation, to, to any generation, but certainly to new generations. So that is my point here is that if by objective, objective circumstance of history, you, you can't feel uh, connected with, uh, with the Second World War because of, of your age, you do work with, with architects who can. And then uh, in this, this is very important thing of generation connections. Because uh, you have to, to reflect it, I think. Um, so I'm going, just one second. Uh, yes, here. Uh, so, also, uh, this is young architect who proposed to do all this latest uh, technological invention in this museum. And again, it works fantastically because it's, it's logical, uh, it's interesting, it's engaging, it speaks a language of our time, and still it's not intrusive. 
It's not like you are sort of uh, overwhelmed by technology, which is very important uh, pattern, as you might know, uh, because why do you think uh, the idea of slow art appeared? Do you know what slow art is? No one? Okay. Slow art is a very new phenomenon which is growing, and it's <laughs> slow art comes from slow food. So, uh, so far, uh, slow art can be allowed only by uh, private museums because Louvre uh, or, or, or some <clears throat> other big museums, they cannot afford this. Private museum can. So what they do, they set up a number of visitors per day, 400, not more. So 50, 50 people per hour. And it allow <coughs> you and people to see things inside museum as they should be seen, in all comfort, uh, without crowd, without, uh, without overwhelming uh, feeling of, of eagerness and crowdness and anxiety. So uh, this is another very, very important thing, how to measure, how to balance uh, architecture space with modern technology together to allow people to be in comfort, especially if you're thinking about something like Great Synagogue, that you would commemorate a thousand year of history and people can't go like for 20 minutes and, and get in, uh, out of it. So they, they have to spend time there. You have to have technology there, but it shouldn't be too much. So how to, to balance this? Where to golden measure of it? How to get way out of it? And this, first of all, uh, the, the purpose and aim for architects and designers. And again, generation-wise, so you have to think. Uh, coming to human dimension. In, in the memorial architecture. Uh, this is the uh, wall of, of Warsaw Ghetto. And uh, I actually had quite difficulty to find the one which was not destroyed yet, and, um, but I did. And um, human dimension in memorial architecture connected with a Second World War is very special subject. Here I would like to, to talk about uh, which way to choose for architect. Shocking way to be document things like they were, like Lipskin did for Berlin Museum, Berlin Jewish Museum, or a metaphorical way to be much more laconic, uh, much more, how should I put it, delicate, yes, delicate, as Mahlamiaki did for Pauline. And this is a very big issue. Probably until <clears throat> everything what I spoke, probably the most important one. So, uh, and of course, it's always subjective. So I'm not profiting here. I'm just putting samples of two approaches and asking you to think and come back to us with your thinking because this is important. Uh, so, who was in, in this place? If somebody was physically, of course. <laughs> From students? Yes, you, you were, okay. So we have one person who was there among you. <clears throat> so this is, now I have to describe, this is very claustrophobic uh, place. It's Berlin Museum, place, not, not the whole museum, but the chambers that I, I'm telling you. It's the last chamber uh, in the, <laughs> narrative uh, of Holocaust on, on the first floor. So you get in and there's no way, metaphorically, to get out. You are in Kafka's world, but in real Kafka world. And this is very cold. It's very harsh. And it's just horror. And I know several cases when people had heart attack just there inside. It really happened because you can't get out of there. And this is true. This is also true. This is what happened to Jewish people during the Holocaust. So a total methodical extermination 
very cold, like cement, which he used. And um, so in comparison with this, I show you here uh, Pauline, who was in Pauline from student. Hallelujah, several people were. Okay, here is up, it's Pauline, and here is um, a fragment of this new project of Rainer Machlamiaki for the Lodstetel. Who knows what Lodstetel is? Very good. So, Lodstetel, the Lodstetel is a museum and memorial complex which is going to be built in Shedova here, two hours from Vilnius. And this is an um, ongoing project, which is supposed to, to be uh, completed in 2020, <coughs> I think, June, May, something like that. And this is, <coughs> this is a shadow of a cemetery, Jewish cemetery, which was restored perfectly well. And as itself, it's a very special memorial. And from the museum, uh, so people are coming to the cemetery, but you can see in comparison with Lipskind, complete closeness of, of the ceiling, here is openness. You see what I mean? And there is a light. Here in Pauline, you have, uh, in comparison with Lipskind's, uh, strong lines which have no argument, so to say. You have uh, another solution by Mahlamiaki, which are curves and which have give you some kind of space and softness. So again, uh, it's, it's a personal choice of an architect. Uh, but it's important issue. What we are doing, we are documenting, and it's it's also personal. It's individual responsibility, right? How how you do your narrative. It's your choice, but you have to to think about it before before you start to to do your work. So while you are students, you have to somehow to construct your path and to choose what you do in, in, in your architectural life as a super purpose. You're documenting horror in absolutely suffocated way, or you just give us, or us, a public kind of breathing. And you have to actually articulate your choice because there will, will be very many questions to you. So this is one of the things I, I would like to, to think very carefully and write uh, in, in your replies uh, to, to my questionnaire. This is one of the Lipskins. As you see, there is light, but there's no way out of this place. And this is uh, Pauline. And of course, uh, this space in Palin, it's about uh, 1,000 years of history of Polish Jewry. It's not only about Holocaust. But Holocaust in the Palin presented in one of the most honest way among many new museums. So it's extremely honest. So, and this is very, very important. It's not declarative. It's very, very factual. And this is the new Lord Stettel's way out, exit. Yes, now I have a question for you, students. How you would like, uh, how you would inter interpret the phrase compassion has no nationality uh, in your vision and in your professional preconditional vision? What does it mean for architectural components in memorial architecture, how you think about. It's just very free your thinking. For instance, absolute tragedy of a phenomenon <coughs> of, of the strata of people called um, uh, the, the lost children of, of the Holocaust, those people in, in Poland, uh, which were uh, 
still five years ago there were over 1,000 and now they, they are dying off. So they are now 700 and then it would be 500. So those people who were given as babies to, to adoptive <coughs> families and who never knew then who they are. And I have personal experience of several of them knowing their stories very well. And it's really shocking when you are 60 something and your father, which you believe is your father is dying, Catholic man, and, and he's telling you that by the way, you're Jew. And that uh, your world is absolutely cracked because you are not belong anywhere. You, you, you do not belong to Jews because of just what you were saying. And you stop to be belong to where you thought to be belong. And this absolute tragedy of, of a big number of people.